Hello and welcome to Political Forum, Wednesday, August 16th. Today we welcome the Alderman Susan Sendlowski Garza from the 10th Ward. Thank you for helping me with that. Uh, thank you for appearing on Political Forum. Thanks for having me. My name is Freddie Calixto. I'm a board member here at CAN TV, and this is a community service that's brought to you by CAN TV. Be sure to let your friends know that they can also watch on the web, and that is on cantv.org forward slash hotline, where they can watch on the web if they do not have the cable channel. Uh, well, we welcome your questions and your comments for the Alderman uh, by calling us at 312-738-1060. During the next 25 minutes, we'll try to get as many questions in as possible. So please call us at 312-738-1060 if you have a comment or a question for the Alderman. And Alderman, we'll get started with uh, our first question. Uh, okay. The hot topic of the week, of the who knows how long it'll last. But it's the, what's your reaction to President Trump's comments surrounding the deadly violence of a white supremacy rally in Charlotte, Ooh. Virginia? Well, um, it really hurts my heart, and actually, I think that um, President Trump is, is supposed to be a leader. And he has taken every ounce of dignity, every ounce of humility out of what a president should be. Um, he should have came out strong in opposition to what happened, and he didn't do that. Um, I, I'm disappointed in his reaction yet once again. Um, this country was built on unity and we're made up of many different cultures and colors, and he should embrace that. He's the president of the United States, and he didn't do that. So I'm, I'm at appall appalled at his reaction. Well, thank you for your answer. Uh, it's something that's on people's mind throughout the nation and beyond. So yep. we'll see where, where it takes us in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, another question in that same area with this. From the White House, uh, Attorney Jeff Sessions made news today when he tied Chicago's sanctuary policies to soaring crime rates and threatening to withhold federal pol police grants if the city does not change. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, I, I'm very proud of the mayor for making um, Chicago a sanctuary city. It's really important because Chicago has always been a melting pot. So um, we as a city council, as well as our, the leadership, the mayor, stand behind that policy. I think Jeff Sessions is, they're hypocritical because they, they always turn the tide and talk about Chicago, Chicago, the violence, this, the violence, that. But they try to take the spotlight off of what's really happening in Washington. So they're using Chicago as a scapegoat. Uh, I think that it's ridiculous that they, they talk about the, we need more police and he's going to send in the National Guard and all this stuff. But then they take away our burn grant, which we actually use as a city to supply the, pe the police with what they need to do their jobs. So if you really cared and if you really wanted to help, you wouldn't be doing that. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think we have a caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, all the women, Garza, I want to know this first, just real quick. I'm 69 years old. I, I, I need a space by my home. Can I get a, a, a handicap uh, pole there saying you can't park there? Sure. Is You can get a handicap pole as long as you get the forms filled out from your doctor first. And you'll get a, a, a lanyard that goes into your, um, your car that hangs from your mirror. And then we can help you fill out the paperwork in order to get those poles in front of your house. So stop in my office at 10500 um, Ewing Avenue, and we can help you th with the first steps, okay? And here is the alderman's office information in case you, you do not have it, and her phone number, as well as her webpage. And that's the map of the 10th Ward. I, I hear that that's the largest ward yep. geographically uh, of the city. We, we do. We have, a, we have the biggest ward geographically in the, in the whole city. So it, it's a big, a big area to cover. Well, I think we had another caller. Are you still there on the line, caller? Caller, what's your question? Hi there. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, my question, I know that the um, other women's ward is borders with Indiana. 
So I'm um, interested to know what her take is on the sugar tax, because I saw on the news the other day that some people were going over to Indiana to spend their money over there to avoid paying the sugar tax. So I'd like to just get her take on that. You know, a great question. You know, we're the only ward that borders another state. And unfortunately for us, it's Indiana, where the taxes are much lower, right? And we've seen that problem perpetuate um, with cigarettes, gas, milk, um, food, and now soda. Um, I'm not for the sugar tax. I think it's a bad idea. We're trying to balance the budget on the back of working class. I mean, as a parent, I never let my kids drink pop. We still don't drink pop. Um, I think it's something that should be left in the hands of what the parents decide. For me, I can walk three blocks to Indiana and and buy pop. So you're still going to get the same demographic. We're just driving people out of Illinois. Um, I don't I don't think we should be taxing. Um, Think goods and services that we use as working class, we need to start looking at people that are making the big bucks and start having them pay their fair share. Uh, the caller, thank you for that question and thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Uh, yes, I wanted to make two. Yes, I wanted to make two points. One, with regard to the whole sugar tax uh, issue, I mean, keep in mind that now that we have this precipitous decline in the use of tobacco products, uh, obesity and obesity-related health issues are the single largest health expenditure in this country. So there is a relationship between creating a disincentive. The same way that we create a disincentive for smoking, one of the reasons that teenagers uh, saw a huge decline in smoking over the last 15 years was because we tax cigarettes so much that the average 16-year-old couldn't afford a $10 pack of cigarettes. So they didn't become smokers. And not allowing people to, uh, to become, you know, diabetics helps. And in this case, you know, let's, how about taxing those people that actually are costing the, the health care system you know, through their behavioral choices? So when you choose to engage in this kind of behavior, it costs the system more money. So it's incumbent upon you to pay for it. So uh, in the same way that we charge smokers more, let's charge people who engage in, in negative behaviors. <coughs> Also, uh, I do agree with you with regard to uh, the remarks by Jeff Sessions. I mean, keep in mind that it's interesting that we have a net uh, immigration of zero in America today, and yet he wants to focus on uh, so-called crimes by undocumented persons. When meanwhile, between 1994 and 2014, we saw the largest decline in violent crime in this country in its recorded history at a time when we saw record numbers of undocumented persons entering America. So this idea that somehow crime is being committed by undocumented persons, and that's where we can lay the blame uh, the, the, on that as a group, is just not supported by the numbers. Uh, keep in mind that uh, cities like New York are sanctuary cities. New York saw an 85% decline in, in its murder rate in the last 15 years. Right. So it, Ms., I'd like to hear what Ms. <coughs> Ms. had to say about that. If, if it was the case that you know the, that sanctuary cities were somehow creating crime or, or precipitating crime, New York is a wonderful place to live. It has a lower crime rate than than the average American city. And yet I agree with you 100%. Sanctuary cities do not create more crime. Immigrants do not create more t more crime. I think once again, it's just a it's a scapegoat. Um, you know, they're using that term as a, as a scapegoat to close our borders, keep people out, um, to create fear and havoc of people of other colors, other nations, other religions. And it's just, it's not working. It's backfiring. And it's, cre it's just creating hate and discontent amongst people. So it's wrong. Thank you for that, <coughs> those comments, caller, and that question. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Hi, Alderman Garza. Um, I'm calling with a question about Labor Day Fest. Um, I'm really, really excited. I was there last year, and it was phenomenal. Um, and the fireworks show was spectacular. So my question is, one, are you guys going to have another fireworks show? If so, what day? And then secondly, what are some of the activities for children? Oh, you know what? Great question. First, let me say thank you so much for coming out last year. It was the first time we ever did it. Um, a fest of that nature, uh, and it was it was wonderful. We had probably 7,000 people out there. We did not have one fight, not one incident, not one arrest. It was wonderful. We had 73 participants in the Labor Day Parade. 
Uh, yes, we are having a firework extravaganza on Sunday night at 9.30. Um, we are also having a laser show right on the lakefront. There will be a kids zone that will be free of charge with camel rides, horseback rides, bouncy houses, um, and it's all free to your kids. So um, we're having crafters and food and there's over 30 bands that will be there. So, and it's, it's all centered around families and labor. So thank you for coming last year. I hope to see you again and tell some more friends. That's the overhead. Yep, that's the Labor Day Parade, which will take part on uh, Saturday, September 2nd. We're up to 73 entries. Chicago Federation of Labor is involved. The Chicago, uh, Cook County Building Trades are involved. Um, last year, we had amazing floats by some of these union members, as well as community members as well. So come on out and uh, show your Labor Day working class pride. It, it'll be a good time. And there's your other one. Yeah, well, we've had we had some bands actually that have sold out House of Blues um, five days in a row. Sixteen Candles, Echoes of Pompeii, which is a uh, Pink Floyd cover band. If you've never seen them, they are phenomenal. If you close your eyes, you you'll think you're listening to Floyd. Uh, wedding band is people are really excited about this band coming every time. Like, oh, you have wedding band, you have wedding band. So. Mr. Funny Man, um, Sounds of Santana, uh, Past Life is going to be there. There are Soul Squad. Um, there's so many. I, it's I know once you start naming something, you're in danger of uh, <laughs> you know forgetting like somebody. But it's going to be a good time. Uh, thank you, caller, for that uh, question and for all that information that we got uh, about the upcoming festivities. Uh, we have another question that we kind of touched a little bit about, and it's the violence that's going on that's gripping the city of Chicago, mm -hmm. especially this summer. Uh, <clears throat> what are your constituents telling you, and what are what do you believe needs to be done to help th turn things around? Well, you know, for me, um, my constituents are, everybody's worried, right? I mean, the numbers are off the charts. And when something happens in your neighborhood, it's scary. It, it scares me, and I live there. But you know what? The 4th District Police Department is phenomenal. And they do the best with what they have. They really do. And, um, you know, now that I'm in this position, it's I know things that I didn't know before. And there a lot of, the, a lot of things that come from... Um, What's happening is we need to start holding people accountable. We really do. Um, I was talking to one of the police officers, and uh, there was somebody that was arrested, uh, a three-time felon. He was caught with a gun in the car, and there was no charges pressed. He walked, and it's like, that shouldn't happen. We need to start holding people accountable. And I don't know what the answer is to that. I'm not a lawyer, but it's a systemic problem. It's not the police, it's not the aldermen, it's, you know, poverty and lack of resources and lack of mental health, closing of schools, and we need jobs. We need all these things to make sure that these kids or the, these, these people on the street that are shooting each other have some kind of productive way to live and grow and make sure that they have um, food on their table every day. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Uh answer it's a very uh, hot topic as you know talked about every everywhere you look and and uh even uh, as you mentioned earlier the uh, the people in dc are using it as a response mm -hmm. uh chicago's violence seems to become the response to a lot of things uh coming out of there but uh number i got another uh question and this is uh related to u.s steel has reaching a deal to sell 440 acres mm -hmm. south work site along the city's uh, south lake front uh, which runs along your ward. Yep. Uh, what's the latest on that, and what does it mean for the 10th Ward? Well, it's huge for the 10th Ward, and, and there's not a signed contract yet. They're still doing their due diligence. Barcelona Emerald Living is in the process of making sure that their idea could come to fruition. Um, hopefully it will. They are going to be building modular homes. They're going to build a factory and then build homes and, you know, put them out onto the onto the property. I'm actually meeting with them tomorrow. They're going to be here um, in the morning, so I'm going to have breakfast with them. I've met with them many times before. This is huge. U.S. Steel was the, the economic engine that drove 
the southeast side. I mean, there was 23,000 men and women that worked there. You know, we had nine steel mills in our ward, that 100, over 100,000 steel workers. So when the mills left, so did the jobs. So with 480 acres, when you start to think about that, that's bigger than the loop. So this is going to be a city within a city. And we're going to need schools. We're going to need hospitals. We're going to need infrastructure. So this is going to be sustainable work for a really long time. So this means a lot. I'm hoping that you know everything can go forward as planned. There was a, a no further remediation clause there that it had been cleaned up. But you know there was a steel mill there for 100 years. So you never know what you're going to find. We're just hoping that everything turns out for the best. As long as the people on the southeast side don't get pushed out and, um, you know, we keep remembering the history and the men and the women that gave their blood, sweat, and tears to that site, we'll be okay. It's, well, it sounds like a major project that's coming it to is, your awards. It is. So it's looking, huge. Looking forward to hearing about how that's going uh, in the weeks to come and months to come. Well, we'll know in November when they close the deal, if, if they do. So Good. We have a caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Yes, it actually ties in with uh, this last uh, question concerning U.S. Steel. I know that the city is looking to look into um, or study the pollution created by steel mills um, in the you know in the area. I know that there's a big Tribune article that came out talking about how the pollution is affecting not only the city but also areas around uh, Lake Michigan. I just want to uh, get the alderman's take on what she believes you know, needs to be done. As far as the pollution that was left behind from the mills. Yeah, yeah, and, and continuing with the mills that are there currently in how we can help um, decrease the amount of pollution in the air for, for the people living around them. Well, compared, compared, compared to what it was when I was a kid, um, there's no comparison. I mean, the EPA and everybody has put such stringent um, restrictions on air quality and air monitoring and water and they're so, it's so different. In the, in the early 60s, the steel mills used to just dump their stuff right into Lake Michigan. That doesn't happen anymore. Now a lot of these steel mills have to have air monitors, and um, we don't have any more steel mills where, I, where I'm at. So, But there are a lot of industry, and they have air monitors that ha they have to report once a month to the Chicago Department of Health. I get, those monitor I get those readings as well. So I think people are watching a lot closer than they used to. I mean, there's a lot of cleanup that needs to be done in my area, from places that were where the steel mills dumped. And I've already been in contact with the US EPA and the Chicago Department of Health and the Illinois EPA and we're working on um, things to make sure that those sites get cleaned up. So I mean that's all we can do. We have to, you know, make sure that we bring it to people's attention, which is what we've done over the past two years and people are starting to rally around and we'll get those sites cleaned up. Great question, a uh, great answer. Thank you so much. Uh, let me remind you, you're watching Political Forum, a community service from Can by CanTV. My name is Freddy Calixto. I'm a CanTV board member, and this is a live interactive show. Uh, so please call 312-738-1060 if you have a comment or a question for the alderman. Uh, let's see what we have one, another question, and okay. I think we touched base uh, on this one as well. It's regarding Chicago Public Schools. Mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on the state CPS uh, so the state budget with CPS and the things that are going on with the state, uh, and what do you think needs to be, uh, what's the most helpful, that will be the most helpful for CPS going into this next oh, year? Oh, man. I, you know, I, I was in education for 22 years, and I think it's atrocious what CPS is doing to our school system. If we don't educate our kids... We have nothing as a society. And over the past mm, six years, all they've done is cut, 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 cut. I've watched them eradicate schools. I've watched them close 50-plus schools. I've watched them take ch uh, teachers away, aides away, lunchroom, privatize. What they're doing is the demise of public education. I mean, I, they have a playbook, and they're, they're just going right along. I mean, we, they announced, what, last week that they're going to lay off another 950 people? What do they think these teachers and these, these kids are going to do? All that get, The only people that get hurt by this are the kids. That's it. You cannot be... We have wonderful teachers in CPS. Wonderful teachers from that come that their heart and soul 
is in their classroom. Nobody goes into teaching to be a millionaire. I'll tell you that much. But when you continue to cut and cut and cut, it's very hard to do your job. I was a counselor. The last year that I left, I was a testing coordinator. We gave 13 standardized tests in one year. 13 standardized tests. They're, they're eradicating history because history isn't tested. T history teachers all over the city are losing, schools all over the city are losing their history teachers because history is not tested. So how can we be a society where we don't teach about our history? Look, we need to come up with better ways to fund education. Let's use TIF money. Let's instill a corporate head tax. Let's have a, a, a LaSalle Street tax. Let's have a, a, an income tax where uh, that's progressive. We can't keep taxing the working class on taxes, 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 and we're still in the hole. We're not fixing it. It's like trying to put a Band-Aid on a machete wound. And what's happening is we're creating a society of kids that aren't going to be educated because the powers that be, the Forest Claypools of the world and, and, and the other people, they don't really care. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. It's a lot to talk about there. Uh, thank you for that answer. And I, we have a caller on the line. Caller, what is your question? Hi, hi. Thank you very much for taking my call. Um, I wanted to ask the alderman specifically, my workplace unionized about a year and a half ago. And during that time, I decided to educate myself on the history of labor in Chicago. And during that process, I learned a great deal about your dad and the huge impact um, he had here in the city. I just kind of maybe wanted you to talk a little bit about his legacy and what that means to you approaching Labor Day and how he kind of rubbed off on you and your decision to enter public life and, and work for people. Wow, that's, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, my dad played a huge influence in my life and I, my mother as well. Um, it, it wasn't easy growing up with a labor leader, let me tell you. He had us walking picket lines and doing gate pass outs when I was six. But um, he rubbed, up on, rubbed off on me in all the, way, all the right ways. And he taught me to stand up, never turn your back. When you know that something is wrong, when, something's, when somebody's doing something wrong, you need to speak up. You need to speak out. Um, my dad did leave a legacy, especially in the 10th Ward. And I hope to do the same. And as long as I follow, and I, I am following in his footsteps. And I'm very proud of that. And my, my dad was very proud of, of where I'm at now. He was, he was definitely in an armchair alderman. So he, uh, you know, tried to give me tips and tell me what to do the whole way through. So um, I'm very proud of what my dad accomplished. He started a whole movement, Steelworkers Fight Back, to make sure that the working class had a voice. And you know what? Here we are 40 years later and we're still fighting the same fight where, you know, we're losing, um, we're, we're losing our voice as a labor movement. And we need to make sure that that voice can get, get stronger instead of weaker. Caller, thank you so much for that question. Thank you. Uh, let me show the website before our time runs out. It's, and this is the website, uh, www aldssg.com okay. so if you want to get on the alderman's website there it is and i just want to put one more plug in for the labor day festival september 2nd and 3rd at steelworkers park on 87th in the lake it's a beautiful park dedicated to the steelworkers that worked at u.s steel um, it's a wonderful time it's it's fantastic it's the only labor day parade in the whole city of chicago and that'll be saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning, and the fest will go Saturday and Sunday till 10 p.m. So come on out and enjoy yourself. It's a great time. Well, hopefully you get a lot of people out there like you usually do. You said you get a lot of <coughs> crowd there. Uh, I, we're running out of time. Uh, Sylvia, I have to thank Sylvia, our, our phone tech, for helping us with the phone calls. I have one last uh, question about... I think you had this yesterday, Democratic gubernatorial. I did. Uh, I did. How was that? You know, it was great. It was great. We had six can uh, five candidates. Two candidates didn't show up, which I was a little disappointed about. I w this is the first ever gubernatorial um, gubernatorial forum ever to be held in the tenth ward, and it says a lot a lot to the candidates that came out that really um, 
It showed that they cared about the far southeast side of Chicago, and everybody left there very happy getting a little bit more insight to these candidates. So that was good. Great. Well, uh, Alderman, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. you. Were great, great information. Uh, you got uh, a big party coming up a couple of, in a couple I of weeks. Do. Come and on hopefully out. you'll have a lot of people in, uh, that, that saw the show would, would uh, attend the show. So thank you very much, and see you thank soon. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.